All right, if you will, find your seat and open your Bible with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll be at 1 Peter chapter 2, and we will be beginning this morning at verse 6. 1 Peter 2, 6. And when you find 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. By the way, if you've come this morning and you don't have a Bible, there are some Bibles provided in the pew to you. You can take those home, and there's some other books there as well that are free for the taking. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. For it stands in Scripture, behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but those who do not believe... The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people... But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Thus says the word of the living God, let us pray. Now, Father, as we've come to serve and worship you this day, we pray, we pray, Lord, that you might give us, give us all that you have for us this morning in this text. Help us to savor each drop of truth. Give us, give us clarity of mind and focus so that we can carefully study your word. We pray for hubber, uh, stubborn, stubborn hearts to change and, and blind eyes to see this morning. We pray that you correct us and that you exhort us and that you, that you give us balance in our hearts. We pray that you encourage us. And Father, we cannot understand your word were it not for the spirit of truth. And so we pray, precious Holy Spirit, won't you come among us and illumine our hearts and minds so that we might grasp the word of God. And we pray these things in the name of none other, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. The Christian life is one that is well described as a life of paradox. Paradox, if you've not heard that term, it simply refers to two things which are both true and yet seemingly on their face contradictory. In the, in the Bible, from Genesis to the book of Maps, describes the Christian life in paradoxical terms. It tells us that we are both citizens and aliens that we are rich and poor, that we are wise and foolish, that we are sinners and simultaneously saints, that we are both rejected and elect. And the mechanism the Scripture gives us to harmonize these seeming contradictions is the kingdom of God, which, if I'm going to be honest, most Christians do not understand, despite its prominence in the teaching of Christ. In fact, let's just, for a moment, let's just think about, let's just think about the ministry of the Lord Jesus right now, just for a second. Before Bethlehem came, Jesus was in the presence of his Father in perfect majesty in the heavenly, seated upon his glorious throne as the creator of all things. There came a time where he entered into a covenant with his Father, and subsequent to that covenant, Jesus took off his kingly crown, stepped off his throne, and entered into all of the limitations of human existence, the creator becoming a creature, the infinite God becoming a finite, unborn child. He goes and he lives and he starts his ministry. And what does Jesus preach? He preaches repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. This is his consistent teaching. He preaches the gospel of the kingdom over and over again. For the kingdom of God is near. It is among you, he says. And what does that mean? What is the kingdom of God? Well, it's very simple. The kingdom of God is wherever the dominion of the king lies. Wherever the king's citizenry lies, wherever he is, 
That is, in fact, his, his kingdom. Now, now think about the ministry of Christ just for a moment. Christ veils his divine glory as he enters into human creation, veiling his divine prerogatives, not exercising the fullness of his deity, humiliating himself to become a human person. And then he's arrested. But before he's arrested, he goes to the garden and he prays. John 17, that prayer is recorded for us. We call it the high priestly prayer because it's very similar to what a high priest would do in the old covenant system where the high priest would go uh, before God on the day of atonement with the people of God in his heart. And this is what Jesus does. And, and he prays and he says, Father, true life, eternal life is through you and the one whom you've sent. And he says that I've completed all the work you've put before me. So certain was he that he was going to the cross that he talks as if it already came to pass. And he says in John 17, 5, And now, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world existed. The Father and Son, eternally glorious in eternity past. And now the Son of God, who is about to complete his ministry, says, Father, glorify me again. Give me my glory back. And the mob comes. They arrest Jesus. They mock him. They beat him. The Jews deliver him up to Pilate. And what's the charge? The charge is he makes himself to be a king. This is why they cry aloud for his blood, because they, he claims to be some kind of king. And Jesus goes before Pilate, and what does Pilate ask him? Are you a king? And Jesus says something very interesting. My kingdom is not of this world. That's interesting because his entire ministry, he was preaching the coming kingdom of God that is coming soon. Jesus gives a bit of a time frame for us at the Last Supper when he institutes the Lord's Supper, or what we call communion, Jesus says to the disciples, I'm not going to drink the fruit of the vine. I'm not going to drink wine again until I drink it anew in my Father's kingdom. And so Jesus is delivered over to the Roman imperial soldiers. He's scourged. He's beaten. And what do they do? They mock him. They put a kingly robe on his back, a purple robe. And they put a crown of thorns upon his head, and they put a reed in his hand, a scepter, and they mock him and they bow down to him as king. And then Jesus is marched out to the place of the skull. He's nailed to that tree and lifted up and they put a sign above his head. And what does it say? King of the Jews. And the Jews are like, we don't want that to say that. But Pilate says, I've written what I've written. And on that cross, Jesus drinks wine, doesn't he? He drinks sour wine thus identifying the fact that the kingdom of God came to earth when a Savior was crucified, which is ironic and horrendous and at the same time incredibly beautiful. That the peak of the Lord Jesus Christ's ignominy, suffering, and humiliation as he hung there naked on that tree, dying a sinner's death, that was when he ushered in the kingdom of God on earth. He did that because it would be that same event that purchased the salvation for a people more numerous than the stars in the sky. And that kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, is the mechanism that we understand the, the paradoxical statements of the Christian life. We're sinners, yes, according to the world, but according to God, we're justified in Christ. We're poor according to the world. Not many of us are captains of industry, and yet in Christ are all the riches of treasures and, and wisdom of knowledge, uh, all the blessings are yes and amen in Christ. Uh, we're fools according to this world. We believe in superstition, they say, but we know that in fact that God has confounded the wisdom of this world with his own foolishness, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the, the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom, is the mechanism through which we harmonize these paradoxes of the Christian life. And I mention that because one of the points of Jesus' preaching in the kingdom of God is to get you to live with a kingdom kind of focus. He wants you to recognize that, in fact, there are two kingdoms on this earth. There is the kingdom of this world, which is passing away, and then there is the kingdom of Christ, which is increasing in its dominion, power, and influence. And Jesus said this. He said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, a, a tiny little seed. You plant it into the ground, and behold, it grows into this big bush, and the birds of the air a nest into it. The kingdom of God, Jesus says, is like a little bit of leaven. You put it in a big lump of dough, and before long, as you work that dough, 
the entire thing is leavened. And this is what Jesus, uh, these are the metaphors he uses to describe the kingdom of God. And everyone, everyone in this room and everyone on this earth is a citizen of one of those two kingdoms. You're either a citizen of the kingdom of the world or you're a citizen in the kingdom of Christ. No one is a free agent. Jesus doesn't tolerate neutrality. He says, you're either with me or you're against me. No one's in the middle. And what Peter would tell us in this passage is not to live like we've got a foot in both kingdoms. What he's going to tell us is that we should embrace Christianity and live truly Christian lives, that we should live Christianly. Because many people in our time, both in the time of Peter and even now, many people are attempting to live in the kingdom of Christ while being worldly. And they give all kinds of excuses for their worldliness, and they say, well, we have to be a little bit worldly in order to win the lost, but nobody ever came to Christ because of worldliness. Rather, what the Bible would tell us is to live distinctly Christian lives for the glory of God and for the expansion of the kingdom of Christ. So let's look at our passage this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning here at verse 6. Peter says, For it stands in Scripture. Now notice he doesn't say, For it is written in Scripture. He's not giving a, an exact quotation here of uh, Isaiah 28. He's, he's doing something uh, that was actually quite popular among rabbis. Uh, he's quoting a text without quoting it perfectly, sort of giving you the high points of the quote. Uh, and this is what rabbis do in what is called midrash, ancient uh, rabbinic commentaries on the Bible. Uh, Peter's using this well-known Jewish methodology to make a point. He says, for it stands in Scripture, behold, the laying in Zion a stone. Zion, that's the place where the people of God dwell. I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so the honor is for you who believe, but Those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now, to understand this, I think you might need to know a thing or two about ancient building techniques in masonry. And so if you lived in Palestine, if you lived in the Judean countryside or in Egypt or Sinai, uh, there wasn't an awful lot of lumber that would be suitable for building. They had trees, but The trees typically weren't the kind of trees that you would use to construct a a home or or some other kind of building. Uh, Rather, if you wanted to use lumber, you would have to import it. And you see this reflected in the building of the temple uh, where Solomon imports cedar from Lebanon. And that's not just because cedar is great wood. It is, uh, but he had to import it because there wasn't much uh, in Israel to build with. And so in the ancient world, if you wanted to build something, you either had to live in a tent you, if you lived in a city, you could build something out of clay or mud, uh, which was predominant in, Jer- in Jerusalem, in the outskirts of the city. But if you wanted to build something that would last, something that would give you a measure of protection, you would build it out of stone. And the way that they did this is they would develop a plan, a building plan, and it would have all of the stones there listed, their dimensions and size, and each stone would be numbered. And then the, that plan would be given over to Uh, The mason who would then harvest and quarry the stone out of the ground. And when he had everything out of the ground, all the stones were numbered and carved perfectly. It would be then that he would go about to build the building and it would be like a big jigsaw puzzle. The most important stone in in that arrangement is the cornerstone. It was not only one of the biggest stones, but it was also uh, even and uh, a very high quality stone. And it had to be high quality because that would be the first stone that would be put in the building process. It would be put on the corner. Uh, The Greek term that is translated cornerstone literally means head of the corner. That stone would be put there first in in a fixed fashion. And it would have to be perfectly level because that stone was set the trajectory for the first two walls and thus the balance of the building. And this is the language that Peter uses. Well, first Yahweh uses, and then Isaiah uses it, and later the psalmist would use it, and then Peter uses it. This is the language that is used to describe Jesus. He is metaphorically a cornerstone. Now, why do they use that language for him? It is because if you build your life upon him, if you, if you predicate your 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 goings-ins and going out in this life, if you, if you build your very existence upon this cornerstone, Peter says, you will not be put to shame. 
you build your life on some other cornerstone, you're building your life on something inferior. Jesus was the cornerstone that was designed to be the bulwark that is based that your life is based upon. And if you build your life on him, you won't be put to shame. And then conversely, he says, the honor is for you who believe. It's a participle there. The honor is for you who are believing and continue to believe. So you won't be put to shame if you build your life on him. He is the only suitable basis for human existence, for human worship. He's the only basis for the church. And if you put your trust in him, Peter says, you will be honored. That is to say that implicitly, if you build your life on something else, if you reject this cornerstone for some trapping of this life, you will be put to shame. You won't receive honor, dignity, and respect. You will receive dishonor. The stone that the builders rejected, Peter says, has become the cornerstone. Now, why would anybody reject a really good cornerstone? Think about that. The mason sees that perfect stone there. Why would he not build with it? Peter will answer that question in verse 8. But think about what is being said here in light of the fact that it's Peter who's writing this, right? Like, remember Peter who often speaks first and thinks later? Let's just think about the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark really is the Gospel of Peter. Uh, Mark was probably an amanuensis for Peter, meaning that Peter probably dictated uh, the Gospel of Mark to Mark, and Mark served as his secretary and wrote it down. That's probably what happened as, as best we can tell. So the Gospel of Mark is really the Gospel of Peter. And in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark chapter 8, and you don't need to turn there, I'll summarize it for you, there's a scene where Jesus pulls aside his disciples, and the first time really ever, he, he sort of spills the beans about what's going to happen. He says to the disciples that the Son of Man is going to be rejected by the elders and chief priests, he's going to be arrested, he's going to suffer, he's going to die, and then he's going to be resurrected. And you remember what Peter's response was? Peter pulled Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. You remember what Jesus' response was? It's unforgettable. Get behind me, Satan. Why did Jesus say that? Because anything that got between him and that cross was necessarily demonically inspired. Peter didn't have a category for a Messiah king that was also crucified and buried. He wanted Jesus to simply ascend the throne. And and there were times in the ministry of Jesus that looked like that just might happen. You can think of the triumphal entry probably being the high point of Jesus' popularity. Interestingly, those same people would be calling for his blood hours later. But Peter, having initially rejected the idea that, in fact, the Messiah would be lost, that he would suffer and die... Now here it says that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. In that account in Mark chapter 8, Jesus says something very fascinating. He says, the Son of Man must be rejected and die and be resurrected. You ever wonder why Jesus talks about himself in the third person, calling himself the Son of Man? Some people say, well, it's like Son of Man, Son of God. He's human and divine. He, He has two natures, which is true. Uh, he is both God and man simultaneously in one person. That's, that's true. But, but that's not what son of man means. It's not merely an identification of his humanity. Uh, that was obvious. That was a given that he was human. The term son of man has a big background in the Old Testament. As you read the Old Testament carefully, you'll see that there is Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, and then there's this other figure who serves as Yahweh's agent, but it is, who Im- is himself a uh, con- Uh, considered deity. He's considered Yahweh himself and yet somehow distinct from Yahweh, just in the same way that Jesus, the Son of God, who is both God the Son and distinct from God the Father. Well, as you proceed through the Old Testament, you see that the angel of the Lord, this, this second power in the Old Testament, is continuously uh, uh, appearing in the most important narratives in all of the Old Testament, the Exodus, the burning bush, angel of the Lord. Judges, Joshua, you name it, he's there. But then something happens when you get to the book of Daniel. A different name is given to this 
angel of the Lord. And so look with me at Daniel chapter 7. This is, I think, really fascinating and super praiseworthy. Think about what Jesus says. The Son of Man must be rejected by the chief priests. He must be delivered up, suffer, die, and be resurrected. And Peter rejects that idea. Where did he get the idea that the Son of Man must simply just rise to power? He got the idea from Daniel chapter 7. Let's begin at verse 9. This is a vision, of course, of Daniel's. He says, I, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took a seat. Now, there are very few places in all of Scripture which describe God the Father. There's only two places that I know of. This is the, this is the big one. Very, very few places anywhere in the Bible which actually tell you what God the Father is like. And so pay close attention to this. Thrones were placed. Probably the 24 elders. Those were probably the thrones. The patriarchs, the apostles. That's my guess. And the Ancient of Days took a seat in the middle. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure will. Now remember, this is a prophecy. This is a vision. You probably shouldn't take this literally. God the Father probably doesn't look like pure white. Rather, Peter's not, or rather, Daniel's not telling us what he looks like, but rather what he is like. Pure white, white as snow, meaning that he is holy and righteous. That his head is like pure wool. In, in the mind of a Hebrew, a gray hair indicated wisdom, uh, because in those days, many people didn't live to their old age till they had gray hair. It indicated uh, uh, some measure of experience in life. And so God here has a head that's white. He is ultimately wise. It's like pure will. Now, could God look like this? Certainly. We wouldn't put it past him. But remember, this is apocalyptic in imagery. His throne was fiery, fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire, meaning that God's throne was not located in one place. It has wheels. It moves. His dominion is everywhere. A stream of fire issued and came out before him, and a thousand thousand served him. Now, in Hebrew literature, a thousand simply means a lot. It doesn't mean necessarily exactly a thousand. Um, That's a sort of literary mechanism within the Hebrew Bible. So a thousand thousands is a lot. And then it says, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. So that's everybody. All people stood before Yahweh, as he sat on his throne, and the court sat in judgment. So this is, the, this is the judgment room, and the books were opened. What books? The books of everyone's life. Do you know that there's a book in the possession of God, which contains your every thought, word, and deed? And there will come a day, Christian or not, where that book will be opened, and God will judge your life. If you're not a believer, you'll have no mediator, and you'll have to answer for your sin. But if you're in Christ, Jesus has provided the definitive answer on the cross. Now skip down to verse 13. In the midst of this court that has taken place, Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came before the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Now, you know that the Israelites were often guilty of idolatry. The main God that they were guilty of worshiping along with Yahweh was Baal, or what is sometimes pronounced Baal. And Baal in Canaanite and Ugarit uh, religion was understood as the God who was responsible for good crops, for fertility, and for all kinds of things. The thing about Baal is he was sort of unreachable. They called him the cloud rider because every time you tried to look at the sky and find him, he would be hiding in the clouds somewhere. And then Daniel tells us this, the Son of Man came riding on the clouds, meaning there is no Baal, there's just the Son of Man. Jesus mentions this in Mark chapter 14, where the high priest, just before he's delivered over to Pilate, says, is it true, are you the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus says, you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds in judgment. And here he is, presented before his Father, and look what happens. And to him was given dominion 
and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. Uh, the, the term there, the verb to serve in the Septuagint is latreo. It's religious service, worshipful service. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And so Peter knows of this text, and he's thinking, the Son of Man isn't going to get crucified and die and be resurrected. The Son of Man is going to ascend to power. He's going to go before the Ancient of Days, and he's going to get all dominion. But he only had half of the story. The principle here is you don't get a crown without a cross. This is why Peter says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Peter here quoting from uh, Psalm 118 and Isaiah chapter 8. He's sort of weaving together this tapestry of Old Testament Bible verses in order to uh, make a grand point. Now the question is, why does the mason see the cornerstone and reject it? Why do people see that Christ is in fact preeminent, that his teaching is true and compelling, and yet refuse to build their life upon him, which people do all the time, especially young people. They hear the gospel, they hear of Christianity, they learn of it, they like it, and yet they reject it. They say, well, maybe I'll come to Christ later in life. And the reason why they do that is because they've got some pet sin over on the side that they love more than eternal life. That pet sin, friends, that is not a life raft. That is an anchor that will drag you right down to God's judgment. But why do people, why do they reject this cornerstone? If, in fact, he is, as Peter says, chosen and precious. The word chosen there in verse 6 is eklekton. It is elect. He is the elect and precious stone. Precious meaning rare and and uh, uh, exceedingly valuable. Why would they reject him if, in fact, this is true? Peter answers, they stumble because they disobey the word. That is the word of God summarized in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to obey the gospel to be a Christian. What does that mean? To lay your lordship down and to put your trust in Christ and him alone. They stumble, Peter says, because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. This, I think, is a terrifying statement. And I, there are about three major implications that we can draw from this statement of Peter that are important to think about. There are others as well, but we'll just draw three. When Peter says that these people are destined to reject Christ, this should strike fear into your heart. That there are some people who will not believe because they were destined to reject the gospel. They were destined to reject the offer of God's salvation. That term destined simply means appointed or ordained. They were ordained unto their, unto their rejection. Now, lest you think that God has to lift a finger to ordain someone unto judgment... Remember what Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 18. I've not come into the world to condemn the world, for the world was condemned already. God must do nothing in order to send someone to judgment. People go there by themselves. Rather, he has to extend incredible effort to redeem even one person. Sending his son, his son living for them, dying for them, resurrecting for them. But he has to do nothing to judge people. Rather, they go to judgment because they hate God and love their sin. And so God has passed over these people, and in so doing, he has, in fact, predestined them unto judgment. Second implication. This, I think, when you really think about it, should give you great encouragement. Have you ever stayed up late at night praying for someone who was lost, pleading with God, pleading with God for their life? Or have you ever had a track thrown in your face? Or have you ever been mocked for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone? And they looked at you, and they laughed. They were destined to do that. Simultaneously, however, that means that there are some people that God will call forth, His elect, 
He will bring them forth no matter what, which means that the successful evangelistic outreach does not depend upon your eloquence. It doesn't depend upon your, your uh, great rhetorical skill. Rather, it depends on your faithfulness because the means through which God calls for his elect is the foolishness of gospel preaching, the foolishness of discipling. And so if someone rejects the gospel, first remember that you don't know if that rejection is going to be permanent. They may hear the gospel today and 10 years later come to Christ because of the seed you planted in their heart. But if in fact they do reject the gospel, don't think that God is surprised by that. It's not like the, the kingdom of God is failing to expand. No, that, that was a, in the plan, the sovereign providential will of God. And so it is when somebody comes to faith. And look at the faces of the people in the room around you because every one of you heard the gospel and in hearing the word of God came to faith. And you're the proof of life that God is calling forth his elect and expanding his kingdom. Third implication. We look around in this world and it would seem like especially in our neck of the woods, that the kingdom of God is losing ground. And I'll grant that. It is losing ground, or so it seems. But if we give it a bird's eye view, and we think about the fact that we started with a hundred people in an upper room, and there are now three billion professing Christians, the Christian life is on the uptick, isn't it? The kingdom of God is expanding like the mustard seed, like the leaven. When people reject the gospel, it is not an impediment to the kingdom of God. Rather, it is evidence of the kingdom of God. That there are two kingdoms that are, in fact, at war with one another. And when somebody comes to faith, out of that morass of unbelief, it is, in fact, miraculous and should be treated as such. Sometimes people ask me, do I believe in miracles today? Of course I do. Every single conversion is a bald miracle. Let me just drop one name, Kanye West. Who saw that coming? Right? Seriously. Because God is still calling forth his people from the four corners of the earth, and he will win. The reason why people disbelieve is because they were destined to And the reason why people believe is because they were destined to. Beginning verse 9, Peter gives a strong adversative. But you, meaning those people, they rejected the word of God as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Peter here takes titles given to the nation of Israel throughout the scriptures, uh, Chosen race, that's an allusion to Deuteronomy, royal priesthood, holy nation, that is an allusion to the book of Exodus, the people for his own possession, again, from from Exodus 19. Peter is taking the titles given to Israel, these really precious titles, and he's applying them to the church, which has all kinds of theological implications. Some people would say, some Christians would say in our day that God has two people. He has Israel, those who are ethnic Israelites, who are Jewish And then he has the church, and God has some promises to Israel and some promises to the church. But that's not the way Peter understands things. Rather, he understands the Israel of God and the church to be one and the same. I'm not suggesting the church replaced Israel. I'm suggesting the whole time it's never been about race because God is not a racist. It's been about faith. The true Israelites, Paul says in Romans 9, are those who believe like Abraham did like David did, like Rahab did. Rahab's a Gentile. The true Israelites are those who believe in Yahweh, those who believe in Christ before he came and thereafter. And so consider yourself an Israelite because it was never about race and it was always about faith. He says, you are a chosen race, a uh, eclecton genos. Uh, Eclecton meaning elect, genos meaning kind or type. Uh, for instance, in John 1.18, Jesus is called the monogenes, the, the one and only of a kind, the unique one. 
when he says you are a chosen race, a, an elect kind of people, he's not talking about your ethnicity because this chosen race is made up of people from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation. You're a chosen race in the sense that you are all, if you're in Christ, elect of God that you've all been regenerated by the Holy Spirit and your affections have been changed fundamentally. So you went from a hater of God to a lover of God, to someone who uh, desired their own lordship above all things, who has now become a slave of Christ. You're an elect race, meaning that you are discernible from the balance of humanity. The elect race shouldn't look the same. It shouldn't sound the same. And it shouldn't be the same as the world. Peter says, but you are a royal priesthood. Now think for a moment, what does a priest do? Remember, this is a term that comes from Exodus. So back in the old system of priest and temple sacrifice, the priest was the mediator between God and man. If you wanted to uh, give a friendship offering or a sin offering, or if you wanted to petition God, you had to go through one of the priests. You couldn't get to God on your own. That was why the system was there. Peter takes that language and he says, you are a priest. Not only, but you are a royal priest. What is in the back of Peter's mind is the fact, the doctrine of union with Christ, which is such an underappreciated doctrine. We should think about this idea of union with Christ just for a minute. The Bible tells us that when you put your faith in Christ, that you are inseparably united to Him, and that you are justified by that faith, meaning that God declares you to be righteous. He credits the righteousness of Christ to your account, so now when God looks at you, He sees you inseparably united to His Son. So your identity and Christ's identity have become intermingled, such that you are now a part of His body, which means that our identity as fellow members of the body, has become intermingled. And that union has massive implications for our life and for the way we approach God. This is why we are all sons of God, both men and women, because we're in Christ. This is what Paul means when he constantly says, in Christ. Now, Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords, coronated upon that cross, what the Gentiles thought is they were mocking him as they put that crown upon his head. But, but what was actually happening is that was his coronation profe- procession. And I, ironically, God took the murder of the Son of God and made it his glorification. And if he's the king and you're inseparably joined to him, and in fact, you are emissaries of the king, you are royal. The term there, is, it simply means kingly, kingly priesthood. And you might say, well, I thought there was only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. Yes, that's true. But here's the thing. The doctrine of union with Christ, Christ tells us that, that you are not separate from Christ anymore. This is the point of baptism. In baptism, you're buried with Christ, you're raised with Christ. You're raised to newness of life in Christ's name. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 6. So if he's a king, if he's royalty... The blessing of being in Christ means your royalty. And if he's a priest, and he is, he's the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, going to Hebrews chapters 9 through 13. I wish we could go there if we had time, but, but Jesus is both prophet, priest, and king. All the offices in one person, the preeminent one. And if you're united to him by faith, if you've repented of your sins and cast your trust on him, then you enter into his ministry of reconciliation and you become yourself a royal priest, which means that you, the church, have become the mediator between God and man. How are people going to hear of what God has accomplished in Christ if they don't hear it from Christ, that is, his body on earth? Because the church is united with Christ, the only hope on the earth is the church. This is why Jesus told us that we would need to be salt and light. Salt being a preservative and light being that which exposes darkness, which is why the church needs to be a prophetic witness to our culture. If the church doesn't say to the culture, no, men are men, 
And women are women. And that's static. Who, who else is going to say that? If the church doesn't say to the culture, actually, these things are wrong and these things are praiseworthy, then who else will do that? What has happened in our day, the reason why our nation is falling apart is because the salt has become unsalty. And may it never be for us. The light has become dark. And subsequently, our culture is falling apart before our eyes. And yet we're given the same commission to be a royal priesthood, to engage as ambassadors of Christ in the ministry of reconciliation. And the means through which we do that is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, you are a holy nation. Hagias ethna, say, a nation that is holy. Uh, typically, people define holy as being set apart, which is only kind of half of the story. It doesn't merely mean being set apart. It means being set apart unto God, which connotes perfection and righteousness and moral uprightness and completion. And he says, you are a holy nation. That is, you are a people who are bound not by common experience, common interests, or anything else, but you're bound by your mutual holiness. That is, the people of God are to be a kind of people who take personal holiness seriously. Christians shouldn't do the same things as unbelievers because, as Peter says earlier in chapter 1, you are to be holy as God is holy. You are to live a life in pursuit of personal holiness. And so you shouldn't watch the same things as unbelievers and you shouldn't listen to to the same things as unbelievers, and you shouldn't do the same things as unbelievers, and you shouldn't say the same things as unbelievers, because you are pursuing holiness in this world is not. There needs to be a discernible difference between the church and the world. When the church becomes like the world, the church as salt loses its saltiness. He says then, a people for his own possession, that is, whereas the people of Israel were merely slaves in Goshen, serving at the, at the pleasure of a despot. God drew, drew them out of that slavery into their own land and became their God. They weren't a people, they were merely slaves, and he made them a nation. And you were in slavery to sin. Your Pharaoh was your own lusts. And Christ powerfully drew you out of that with a strong right hand redeeming your life, giving you a new nature, making you righteous in God's sight, and giving you the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You were not a people, but now you're God's people. Don't lose sight of these things, these precious gifts. These are the gifts of what it means to be in Christ. Now, why has he given us these gifts? Peter tells us, When it says, that you may proclaim, in the Greek of the New Testament, there is a uh, preposition, it's hina. It always indicates a purpose statement. Somebody will say something, and then if you want to know why, it'll say, hina, this is why. And this is what we have here. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, for the purpose that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The reason why God has bestowed these wonderful gifts upon you is not so that you can keep your mouth shut. It is not so that you can live comfortably pursuing the American dream. The reason why God has redeemed you and given you all these precious gifts is so that you will proclaim. The the word there is a word from which we get evangel. It is a word that refers to, in the New Testament, to gospel proclamation, so that you can proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness, and into his marvelous light. So the purpose for your salvation is so that you would, in fact, become a witness. And then you might use your time, your, your reputation, your treasure, your influence, to expand the kingdom of God by the proclamation of the gospel. It is the foolishness of gospel preaching and evangelism 
that is the means by which God is calling forth His people all over the world. And again, you shouldn't, you shouldn't take rejection as a sign of failure. Rejection in this life, when it comes to the gospel and evangelism, is only a sign of something that God is going to do. I mean, think about, you know that the one nation where the gospel is spreading the fastest, you know what it is? You might be surprised. It's North Korea. The gospel is spreading. There are more Christians being made in North Korea per capita than any other place in the world. North Korea also happens to be the most hostile to Christianity. If you get called the Bible there, you die. The rejection we see in our time is merely the precursor to the victory of Christ, and it will be through the proclamation of the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You lived in darkness when you were lost, before you knew Christ. You didn't have the wisdom of God. You didn't understand the truth, and now you do. And therefore, it is negligent for you not to say something to others who lie in darkness. Then Peter concludes, verse 10, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In the same way the other statements he made are allusions or quotations from the Old Testament, this is also one. This is an allusion to the book of Hosea, and I'd like, in closing, to turn there. Look with me at Hosea chapter 2. Now, just briefly, let me summarize for you what the book of Hosea is all about. Israel, at this time, has committed spiritual adultery against Yahweh in the sense that they have They have sought other gods. They have, in the words of Hosea, whored after other gods. They have forgotten Yahweh. They've stopped keeping his Sabbaths. They've stopped obeying his law. They've gone after other gods, idols, things made by human hands, forsaking the creator of all things for creatures. And so God tells this prophet, Hosea, that he's essentially going to make him an example of what God will do and has been doing in the economy of redemption in in Israel. And so Hosea is told by God to go marry a very promiscuous woman. Her name is Gomer, which must have been a more attractive name than it is now, because all I can think about is Gomer Pyle when I hear that name. But he goes and he marries Gomer, he obeys God, and, and they have a child. First child's name is not my people. Because the people of Israel have forsaken God and have become not his people. Gomer gets pregnant again, has another child. God tells Hosea, name that child no mercy, because I will not give mercy to the people. Gomer then goes out and lives a life of extraordinary promiscuity, forsaking her husband and breaking covenant with him. And she's worse than a prostitute because she doesn't do it for money. She plays a harlot so bad that she eventually gets sold into sex slavery. And right when she's at her lowest point, Hosea goes to the auction block and buys his wife back. And he takes her home, and he cleans her up, and he treasures her and loves her. And the God of Israel says, this is what I will do for for you. Look with me at verse 14 of Hosea chapter 2. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, that is, that is my people, and bring her into the wilderness, that, that is, I will bring her away from her lovers, and I will speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there shall answer as in the days of her youth, as in the time she came out of the land of Egypt, when she truly believed in me. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. You'll know that God is, in fact, the true God, and that he will tolerate no pretenders. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, 
and they shall be remembered no more. And I will make a covenant for them on that day with the beasts of the fields and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow and the sword and the war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and steadfast love and mercy. These were not righteous people. They were not just people. They were bloodthirsty They were idolatrous. They were fornicators. And yet, God says, I will betroth you to me, meaning I will marry you in righteousness, justice, steadfast love, and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Notice who's doing these things. The nation of Israel didn't initiate this arrangement. Rather, This salvation is ordained by divine initiation. And in that day, I will answer, declares the Lord, I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain and the wine and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. This picture of Hosea and Gomer, of Israel and God, and ultimately of you and Christ, is not to be taken lightly. God had given you the breath in your lungs. He had provided everything you've ever enjoyed and tasted. And yet you took the life that you were obligated to honor Him with, and you squandered it on your own lusts and sin. You effectively became like Hosea or rather Gomer, committing spiritual adultery upon the precious Creator. And yet, out of His steadfast love, He's entered covenant with you in Christ. And He says to you, once you were not a people, but now you're my people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you receive mercy. What a great salvation. Let's pray. Father, we give you great praise for what you've done in Christ. We can't even marshal the words in order to in order to express our gratitude for what you've done. You've taken rebels and made them sons and daughters. You've taken your enemies and made them your friends. So we pray, Lord, that in fact we would, given the gifts that you provided, proclaim the, the marvelous nature, the excellencies of the Son of God. We pray, Lord, that our life in this way would be an offering, an offering not to garner peace with you, but rather that we might obey your word because we have peace with you in order to display the gratitude we have for the great salvation you've wrought for us in Christ. Father, we pray here for the lost, for those who do not know you, perhaps for those who have heard the gospel today for the first time. We pray your spirit would be with them that your spirit would regenerate their heart and that you would woo them unto yourself, just as Hosea reclaimed Gomer. Lord, we stand stand on the even ground at the foot of the cross and we pray for our nation and our lands, for our families and loved ones. We pray that we might honor you in thought, word, and deed, and most of all, the proclamation of the gospel. And we pray these... We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.